12 CR 1522. The record should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys and the prosecutors are present as well. We are outside the presence of the jury. At one of the bench conferences that we had earlier today, Mr. King asked me to uh, give the jury an instruction based on the fact that it appears that some of the questions submitted by the jurors reflect that at least a couple of them appear to have some medical background. And I went back and looked at Kendrick versus Pippin, K-E-N-D-R-I-C-K, and Pippin is spelled P-I-P-P-I-N, 252 Pacific 3rd, 1052, a Colorado Supreme Court case from 2011, which was abrog abrogated on other grounds in um, Bedar versus Johnson, that's B-E-D-O-R, 292 Pacific 3rd, 924, Colorado Supreme Court case from 2013. And I, I have taken a crack at drafting an instruction, and I'll give a copy of the proposed instruction to each side here in a minute, but it, it would read as follows. Uh, jurors are allowed to use their background, including their professional and educational experiences, to inform their deliberations so long as they do not bring in specific factual information learned from an outside source. The line between a juror's application of her professional and educational experience to the evidence presented in the trial and a juror's introduction of specific factual information learned from an outside source can be a fine one. Any experience used by a juror in deliberations must be a part of the juror's background gained before the juror was selected to participate in the trial and not as a result of an independent investigation conducted after being selected as a juror. Additionally, a juror may not introduce specific facts from an outside source that are not part of the evidence in the trial. So I'll have my staff give each of you a copy. Can you please, Ms. Robinson? And then take a look at it and let me know if you want me to um, make any changes to it or provide a different instruction. Um, I'm not crazy about the first line in the second paragraph. I put it in there just so that you could take a look at it. Uh, frankly, the first paragraph might be sufficient, but um, it's a, it, it is a, a fine line between, on the one hand, being able to use your background, uh, including your professional and educational experiences, and on the other, not being able to bring in specific factual information from out, outside the record. Um, but it's the best I can do. That's what uh, Kendrick held. That's what Kendrick talked about. And I'm uncomfortable deviating too much from the language that the case used. And I think it drives the point. I think uh, in that case, I think it was uh, the juror was an engineer. And I think he relied on some formula that he was familiar with. And the court found that that was OK, because he was simply relying on his professional experience and not bringing in any specific facts uh, from an outside source. But take a look at it, and then let me know um, how you want me to proceed, all right? Are you ready for the jury, uh, Mr. King? Yes, we are, Your Honor. Are the people ready for the jury? We are, Your Honor. Let's bring the jury in, please.
Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom. I hope you had a good lunch, everyone. <laughs> By the way, it is cool in here, um, and that must make some of you happy. At least a couple of you I know are happy as a result of that. It might not make some of you as happy, uh, and I mentioned this to somebody last week. Uh, I can't make everybody happy, um, and you know, the way that the system works, because it's a pretty old building, is that they tend to keep the courtrooms cooler in the morning with the anticipation that with the heat, it's going to get warmer throughout the day. So usually, if you've noticed, by the time we get to 3 or 4, it's warmer than it is at 8.30 in the morning. And that, that's why. If we make it warmer in the morning, then it's going to be uncomfortable. Uh, in the afternoon. So this is sort of the best we can do with what we have. And so those of you who are too cold, you may plan on dressing for winter when you're here. <laughs> All right. Let me uh, ask Mr. King or his colleagues to call their next witness at this time, please. Your Honor, the defense calls Dr. Holland. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Could I have you raise your right hand so that I can administer an oath? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. All right, please be seated. Please tell us your full name and spell your first, middle, and last names. John Craig Holland, J-O-H-N, C-R-A-I-G, H-O-L-L-A-N-D. Ms. Hayes, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Fine, thanks. Um, sir, what do you do for a living? I'm a physician. Where? Denver Health. Tell the jury, please, a little bit about your um, education to become a physician, when that occurred, where that occurred, that type of okay. thing, please. I grew up in Colorado. I did my undergraduate work in Boulder. I went to medical school here in Denver. Graduated in 1975. I did a residency in internal medicine at George Washington University Hospital in Washington, D.C. Let me ask you a question. What is internal medicine? Internal medicine is a specialty that deals with diseases of adults. Uh, it includes a lot of different areas, cardiology, pulmonary, endocrinology, infectious disease, all the basic organ systems that deal with adult health. Let me, let me interject for just a moment. Doctor, I'm going to ask you to slow down just a little bit. Okay. My court reporter uh, needs to take uh, down every word. And, okay. Um, so if you would just slow down a little bit, please, okay? All right. You want me to repeat anything? Um, do you need him to repeat the last answer? No. Okay, great. All right. Next question, please. Sir, I have a tendency to speak fast myself, so I'll try to remind you if you get going again. When you say you did your residency in internal medicine, what year again did you say you did that? 1975 to 78. Did you practice internal medicine? Well, when I finished that, I did a fellowship in endocrinology at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And then I, uh, I was an Army physician for uh, 24 years active duty, uh, plus five years as a civilian. And I practiced internal medicine and endocrinology and geriatrics for about 19 years. Okay. At some point, did you go back and do another residency? Yes. And what was that in? Psychiatry. When did you do that? 1994 to 1997. Um, when you say you went back to do a residency in psychiatry, kind of explain to the jury what that entails and why you did that. Well, I was uh, always interested in psychiatry, uh, and I had... I'd gotten a lot of satisfaction out of doing internal medicine, geriatrics, and endocrinology, but I wanted to try something different. And so instead of, when you're a, a staff physician, you, you basically practice independently. You don't need any supervision. Uh, to get expertise in a different area, you have to go back for a period of time uh, and retrain in a different area, and this is what I did in psychiatry, and that took three years. So you didn't have to go back to medical school because you already had your medical degree, is that fair? Correct. Now, you do need a medical degree, though, to practice psychiatry, is that right? Uh, either an MD or a DO. Okay. And you already had your MD, but you had to go back and do a residency. Right. Where did you do that? Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. Okay. Um, 
And since then, what has been the focus of your practice? So since 1997, I've done strictly consultation psychiatry. I, I've done a little bit of outpatient psychiatry. Mostly, I see people that are hospitalized on a surgical floor, a medical floor, intensive care, OB, who have some kind of problem that their attending physician thinks has to do with the way that their brain works. And so I will go there as a consultant and see that person and make an assessment, a diagnosis, recommendations, and, and follow the patient as appropriate with the primary team. And that's what I still do at Denver Health. Now, it sounds to me like you are in a unique situation in that you bring a number of years of practicing sort of internal medicine, endocrinology to your psychiatric practice. Um, do you think that's unique and do you think that helps you in your practice? There are, there are some people that have these skills, not a lot, but it does help me, it, especially when I'm seeing people that are hospitalized. I can understand a little bit about what some of the medical conditions are, the surgical conditions, and understand that interface between so-called physical illness and mental illness. Is it, um, does it happen sometimes that mental illness and physical illness may overlap a little bit? Where I work all the time. Okay. Um, have you also done teaching in um, internal medicine or sort of non, your non-psychiatric medicine experience? Do you teach from that experience? Yes, I was on the, uh, the faculty at the University of Hawaii, John A. Burns School of Medicine. For how long? Um, 28 years. What about in psychiatry? Do you also teach in that area? I'm currently on the faculty at the University of Colorado here. How long have you, te have you taught psychiatry or in psychiatry? Uh, since about 2000, 2010. Okay. You said that you um, currently work at Denver Health. How long again have you worked there? Okay. I started in the summer of 2009 and the consultation work that I do started uh, in March of 2011. And you, and you, so you've been working there doing that cons consultation work from 2011 to current day? Right. All right. Um, Your Honor, if I may approach with defense D-TR-77, please? Yes. Doctor, I'm showing you what's been marked as D-TR-77. Um, is that a current, well, is that a, a, at least a fairly recent copy of your CV? Yes. Okay. I think it's dated November of 2014, so it's fairly recent. Yes. Um, and does, does that CV detail your training, your experience, your teaching experience, both in internal medicine, endocrinology, as well as in psychiatry? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, I move for admission of D-TR-77 at this time. Is there any objection, Mr. Orman? No, Your Honor. All right, without objection, it is admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, sir, is there anything in particular about your, your experience that um, I haven't touched on that you think is particularly relevant, something I missed? No, I, mean, I think you've covered it. I, had, uh, I was lucky. I had a lot of opportunities, uh, both in the Army and here. I've seen a lot of different kinds of things, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the training that I've had. Excellent. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd also actually now move to um, qualify Dr. Holland uh, pursuant to Colorado Rules of Evidence 702 as well as People versus Shrek as an expert in both psychiatry as well as internal medicine. Is there any objection? Not to those two specific areas, Your Honor. All right. Without objection and pursuant to Rule 702 of the Colorado Rules of Evidence and the decision in People versus Shrek, which is published at 22 Pacific 3rd, 68, Colorado, 2001, the court accepts Dr. Holland as an expert witness in the fields of psychiatry and internal medicine. That means, folks, that he now may render expert, expert opinions in those two areas. I remind you that uh, you are not bound by the testimony of an expert witness.
uh, and the credibility of an expert's testimony is to be considered as that of any other witness. You may believe all of an expert witness's testimony, part of it or none of it. The weight that you give the testimony is entirely your decision. Uh, Ms. Higgs and Mr. Orman, is this a good time for me to give the limiting instruction? Sure. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, members of the jury, the court has admitted the testimony of Dr. Holland only for a limited purpose. You may consider this testimony only as to the issues raised by the defendant's plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. You shall not consider this evidence for any other purpose. All right, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, based on what we've already talked about, um, I'm assuming you're working at Denver Health Medical Center in November of 2012? Yes. And uh, did you have opportunity to treat a patient by the name of James Holmes? Yes. Now, Dr. Holland, when he came to Denver Health, um, did Denver Health choose to give him sort of a, 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 a different name? Uh, yes. Okay. And, and what was the name, do you recall, that Denver Health chose to give him? Brady, Arkansas. And do you recall why they did that? Uh, nobody talked to me specifically about that. I just assumed it was a very high visibility case with a lot of uh, legal ramifications and they wanted to keep confidentiality as much as possible. Okay. So if, if, if the jurors look at any of the records from Denver Health and it indicates Brady, Arkansas, is that the person that you know to, to be James Holmes? Yes. Okay. And Your Honor, if I may now approach with D-TR-78, please. Yes. Sorry, we're um, sometimes getting confused with the numbers. So, Doctor, um, be before we talk too much about that, I want to ask you some sort of preliminary questions. With regard to your work at Denver Health, is it your practice and sort of the practice of Denver Health to document your work at, uh, in, in progress notes? Yes. Is part of the reason for that because, like you said, you're working on a consultation team and, and other people need to rely on the work you're doing? Yes. And do you need to rely on notes that other people make? Yes. Okay. Um, when you saw, who is Dr. Ryan Morose? Dr. Ryan Morose was a second year resident that worked with me. Uh, and that's the resident, it's a teaching hospital. So I'd say 99.9% .9 of all patients that I see, I see in conjunction with a resident in training. Um, they act as a scribe. We see the patients together. Uh, our supervision is very tight and I'm, I'm in the room with him every second and I supervise everything that he writes. Do you review the notes that he uh, takes down? Yes. And do you indicate that by initialing uh, the notes? Yes. Okay. When you, if you would look at D-TR-78 um, does that appear to be a copy of the progress notes you made with regard to your treatment of Mr. Holmes? Yes. And, excuse me, do you see your initials at various places in that document? Yes. As well as some of your own notes that you wrote, is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, does it appear to be an accurate copy of the notes that you took? Yes. Your Honor, we would move now for admission of D-TR-78, please. Mr. Orman, do you have any objection? Subject of the limiting instruction, Your Honor. All right. Uh, without objection, D-TR-78 is admitted. But members of the jury, I instruct you that this exhibit is being admitted for the limited purpose that I indicated a moment ago. Does everybody understand that? And everybody's saying yes and nodding their head yes. Great. All right, Ms. Higgs, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, if I may approach again, Your Honor, with D-TR-79. Yes. D Doctor, I'm handing you D dash, what's been marked as D dash TR dash 79, and it is a, a blank calendar from November of 2012. Do you, is, is that correct? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and how many times did you see Mr. Holmes um, 
during that, that week-long period that he was at Denver Health in November of 2012? I saw him twice on Friday the 16th of November and once on Tuesday the 20th of November. Okay. And do you recall what, when he was admitted to the hospital? Yeah, he was admitted the night before Thursday the 15th of November 2012. So so the night before you saw him right. on the 16th? Uh, the admission note was timed, I th I'd have to look at it to be absolutely sure, but it was around 8 o'clock at night, between 8 9.30, something like that. Okay. Do you recall what time you initially saw him on the 16th? 11.30. And you said you saw him twice that day? Right. What time was it you saw him the second time? Uh, 1400 hours, 2 p.m. Okay. Um, and do you recall what time you saw him on the 20th? Would looking at your notes help refresh your recollection? Right. Okay. Um, that would be at 08.20. Okay. In, so 8.20 in the morning. Yes. So what I'd like you to do, if you would, Dr. Holland, is there should be a pen up there at the witness stand. Or if you have a pen. I've got one, yeah. <laughs> um, if you could write your name... Uh, and today's date on that calendar and maybe the top left corner. Today's date. Yes. And if you could mark on there the uh, date and time that you, times plural, that you saw Mr. Holmes, please. And if you could also mark on there the date and time that you believe he was admitted. And the date and time, if you know it, that he was released. And was he released on the 20th of November? He was released on the 20th. We, I was the last person on the team. We saw him. He was safe enough to be discharged from our facility. Okay. So now with regard to that calendar, um, Your Honor, may I approach to take a look at it? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Um, Your Honor, I'm going to show this to the prosecution. And move for admission of D-TR-79. All right, Mr. Orman, do you have any objection? I don't. All right, without objection, it is admitted. Thank you. I'm going to just leave this up here. Doctor, I'm going to get into your notes with you in just a moment, but I want to give the jury just a, a little bit more understanding of this consultation team that you work on and have worked on at Denver Health. Um, so can you just explain the dynamics of how you all work together? Okay. So there's, uh, there's three attending psychiatrists, one attending psychologist. Uh, we have a schedule set up. We rotate days. Most of the time, there's just one of us on at any given time, occasionally two. Uh, we start on weekdays, Monday through Friday at 7.30, review all the cases that we have to see, who's active, try and prioritize the cases, uh, divide up the cases, who's going to see who. We have a, a second-year resident in psychiatry and a last year uh, resident uh, in psychology working on their PhD. So we may have some medical students. We may have a couple of more residents sometimes. We may have a physician assistant trainee. So we kind of compose our team and sort of plan the way that we're going to organize our day in terms of how we go out and see patients. And then the other thing is, is that we have a, a, a single pager so that if any new consults come in or a question comes in, something like that, somebody in the hospital, uh, can call us to ask specific questions about the patients that they see. So and then we just we go up, we go see our patients, we write our notes. Uh, we may regroup once or twice, kind of have checkout rounds, maybe around 5 o'clock at night, and we come back the next day. On the weekends, there are pre-assigned physicians 
to cover those times that we're not there. Same with the, and the nights. Usually the nights are covered by, in, during the week, are covered by somebody that's in the, what's called the psychiatric emergency service. They have a, a full-time physician in the ER. It's a, it's a dedicated emergency room for psychiatric patients that's next to the medical emergency room. Why is it that this is set up as a team versus one doctor just seeing the same patient every single day? I think that um, it's sort of historical. Uh, the, um, the intensity of the, of, the, of the patients that you see, the acuity is uh, pretty high. And I think that we also feel like that uh, there's added value to having uh, uh, added second opinions, in this case, third or fourth opinions, so we don't get trapped into just like one person seeing the person all the time. So we get, a, we get uh, different opinions about how we're taking care of the folks that we see. So I think that that gives a better quality. Do you think that it gives a... So, so you get to sort of rely on, instead of just your, what, 20 years of experience mm -hmm. in psychiatry, you get to add to that the 30 plus years of experience of Dr. Weintraub, the 10 plus experience of Dr. Davis, and so forth. Is right. that accurate? That's correct. Okay. Leading. Sustained. Now, with regard to uh, your experience, um, do you, is it, well, tell me, have you seen a lot of patients that present with, psycho with psychosis? Yes. Okay. Is there any way, I know it's hard, any way to, to, to quantify that over the entire course of your career? I might say hundreds. Okay. Um, when you were working at Denver Health Medicine, um, Denver Health Medical Center, you, s you just used the words intensity, acuity. Um, are the patients that you're seeing there uh, in sort of through psychiatric emergency uh, unit, I'm not sure if I'm getting any of these words correct, but do you see a lot of patients that are acute and with intense symptoms? Yes, and again, the patients that we see, they're on, we see in the medical ER and on the medical floors. We don't see patients on the psychiatric floor or in the psychiatric emergency room. Okay. So we're, we're kind of the arm for psychiatry to help all the other specialties of the hospital. Okay. Um, all right. Before you went to see Mr. Holmes the first time, which I believe you said was at 1130 in the morning on November 16th, is that right? Correct. Did you first gather information before you went to um, evaluate him? We didn't really have to. All the information was basically down in, in the correctional care medical facility, the jail notes, the admission consult. That's all the information that existed. There was no other information from any other source. So we went down there and we reviewed the jail notes and reviewed the admission note. When you say we, do you recall who, who is we? Well, my resident and I. Okay. So Dr. Moroz? Right. Okay. So did you review the information from Dr. Davis from the yes. before? Yes. Okay. And what information did you have from the jail? Well, in the, in the jail, they have a printout and there's, there are dated and timed entries uh, that are what well, depends, if the patient's very stable, they're not very frequent. There might just be one entry a day, and it says eating, sleeping, good hygiene, watching TV. Mm -hmm. So if nothing's really happening, the entries are fairly short. And so we had a couple of those kinds of entries prior to November 11th, because they were on this printout sheet. And in the, at the middle of that sheet, on November 11th, you could see that there was, there was a big change. Mm -hmm. And over the next four days, there was just a series of uh, self-destructive behavior, being naked, uh, having unusual postures, saying unusual things, uh, defecating in the room, smearing feces, uh, not eating, not drinking, not communicating, being mute. And that went on from November 11th until the time that he was transferred to Denver Health. How are those, how is that information significant to you? Well, it's useful because it's, it starts to give you, it, you're relying on that these are nurses and physicians in this other facility. Um, they have experience, they observe these things, they record them, and, and the more precise their records are, some of the things are fairly simple. 
not eating, not drinking. That's fairly objective. And you, then you take that sort of historical information and you match it up with objective data that you get once they're admitted, like say his medical examination, the results of his laboratory studies, those kinds of things. And it helps you, you, you look at subjective information, objective information, you come to an assessment, a diagnosis, and you can formulate a plan. Okay. Um, so let's move into your first uh, visit with Mr. Holmes. And Your Honor, I've made copies of D-TR-78, the progress note, and I'd like to publish these to the jury so they can sort of follow along as we talk about it, because it's going to be way too tiny for this TV. All right. If I may? Yes, give them to my staff, please. Ms. Gerlings and Ms. Robinson, and they can distribute them to the jury. Thank you. And members of the jury, this is the same procedure we follow with other exhibits. So we're going to give each of you a copy of this particular exhibit and then we'll retrieve it from you at the end of the testimony. Now, Doctor, uh, you, you just talked a little bit about the information that you had before you went in to see Mr. Holmes. Do you just take that, like what other doctors are saying, as, as the way it is, or do you go in to make your own assessment? Well, we try and reestablish. There's a, in other words, what you're asking is, is that primary data is data that I obtain myself. Secondary data is from somebody else. Uh, if I know the person, uh, if their secondary data seems reasonable. Uh, but I, I still try and verify as much as I can. I try and reestablish their findings to see if it fits the diagnosis as, as, or the, what we think the working diagnosis is, especially early in the course of a, of a new patient. Okay. Um, so, Doctor, if you're looking at the first page of the exhibit there that you have, um, is this the progress note that you made on November 16th, 2012 at 11.30 in the morning? Yes. Okay. Now, when, um, when you w met with Mr. Holmes at that time, were you actually able to evaluate him or assess him at all? And the, the salient part of this particular visit was is that he was so sedated we couldn't even arouse him even by shaking his legs. So our intervention was to talk to the medicine attending, Dr. Frazier, to talk to the nurses and the sheriffs, about what happened the night before. We, we made some changes based on some new data that we had, but the direct interview with the patient was really impossible. And when you go down further, they're an objective. All those things like says speech, mood affect, UTA means unable to assess. Okay. Um, did you know why he was so sedated? The hypothesis was from medication. And what we, he had, when he came in the night before, the way he was treated was with a low-dose antipsychotic, low-dose anxiolytic, uh, a medicine called cogentin, which is an anticholinergic that sort of counteracts some of the effects of the Haldol, the antipsychotic. He had gotten some of this medicine uh, a little bit before we saw him, so that we thought that in his particular case, uh, one, of the, one of the side effects of, of these kinds of medications is sedation, and that's what we were seeing, and that's why we made some adjustments in his medicines. What were the adjustments that you made, and where is that noted on here? Well, on the second page, uh, about halfway down, if you look at sort of plans and recommendations, uh, and, and, in the, and then at the very bottom where it says attending only below this line, the very last part there, right above my name, that's a little bit more legible. The first thing we did was we stopped the cogentin, benztropine. Uh, that's one of the anticholinergic side effects is it can cause urinary retention. And the patient had 700 cc's of urinary retention, which is grossly elevated. In his age, it should be maybe 10 cc's. Okay. Uh, and then we, because Haldol is a, what's so-called a first-generation uh, antipsychotic, more old-fashioned, 
it has uh, a limited uh, mechanism where it works. We switched that to a second generation antipsychotic called Resperdal or Risperidone and started off in modest doses, one milligram twice a day. And we also put a cap on the Ativan, the lorazepam, that's an anxiolytic. It doesn't treat psychosis directly, but it can also cause sedation. And so we wanted to limit the, the amount that he could get on that so that we could sort of allow him to wake up. Okay. When it says Risperdal 1, I'm assuming that's 1 milligram BID, what does yeah, that mean? That means twice a day. Okay. Um, you said se he had 700 cc's of urinary retention. Right. Now, um, if you look a little bit um, up toward that fir the, the top of that second page, it has assessment and then it has axis 1, axis 2, right. axis 3. Um, what was the axis one? Um, is that a diagnosis? Is that a? It's a it's a system of classification, and I should just say that in psychiatry we use what's called the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. We're currently in the fifth generation of this. The fifth generation came in 2013. When we were seeing this patient in 2012, we used what was called DSM four text revised TR. Okay. And one of the big differences between four and five is, is five eliminates this multi-axle assessment. But in DSM-4, when we did an axis one or the major psychiatric illnesses, axis two is diagnoses primarily in childhood, like intellectual disability and personality disorders. And axis three are the medical conditions. Okay. There's two other axes, but, but they're not listed on this, this form. Um, when, when you have this note here that axis one is psychosis NOS, is that something that you have confirmed? Is that something that a doctor prior to you has confirmed? So where does that come from? Well, it could be both. Okay. okay. And in this case, our diagnosis and the preceding diagnosis were congruent. They were the same. The psychosis not otherwise specified, all that really means is it's a domain of psychosis. You look for hallucinations, delusions, disorganized speech, disorganized behavior, prominent negative thoughts, could have catatonic features, funny posture, selective mutism, those kinds of things. What it means is, is we, and there's a differential diagnosis to that, and it can include medical conditions, substance-induced, and then the more commonly known psychiatric illnesses like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, those kinds of things. But for us, all we could do was say it was in the domain of psychosis. We couldn't, we could list what a differential might be, but we would need a lot of information about this person before they came to see us, and, um, and then follow-up information, the, the time course, the family history, those sorts of things. We didn't have any of that information. You would want to know um, how he presented say, even in childhood, adolescence, uh, in the years before he came right. to the hospital. Right. What was his, his pre-morbid function, his function before this episode of illness started? Okay. So that, those kinds of things is what you would need to get it beyond not otherwise, psychosis not otherwise specified? Correct. Okay. You say uh, under axis three there's the word, I think it's hy hypernatremia? That means his serum sodium was elevated. Okay. And that's pretty significant. Um, the brain works based on its environment of electrolytes, sodium, potassium, mm -hmm. its acid-base balance. All of those things are important for normal uh, central nervous system function, normal brain function, normal, normal neuronal function. Okay. The next thing you write is delirium resolving. Can you explain that for the jury? Yeah, what I probably should have said there was more hypernatremia resolving. The delirium, I, I thought when I first saw him, he had elements of both delirium and psychosis. And, and let me stop you there. When you first saw him, do you mean you first saw him here at 1130 or when you were actually able to evaluate him later that day? Both. Okay. Both. Please continue. And, and delirium is an impairment of consciousness. It's, it's sort of uh, lower down in the way that the brain works. Uh, it has to do with the brain stem, what's called the reticular activating system. Those things have to be working properly for us to evaluate things like language, memory, what we call executive function. So when a person has inattention and the inability to arouse him, that qualifies as inattention, and he has uh, some mild metabolic aberrations like his, both his potassium, his sodium, his acid-base balance was a little bit out. All of those things could make any underlying psychosis worse. Okay. 
when you you just said the word mild mild underlying yeah, I mean, his sodium, I think the highest it was was 152. When we saw him, it was 149. It was starting to get better. It wasn't uh, usually when you see mental status changes that are due purely to an elevation in the sodium, it's going to be higher. But it's, it's different in every single individual. Most of the time, this is a problem in geriatric patients uh, that have a lot more uh, comorbid medical illnesses. With the sodium level, what did you say the highest one, 152? I think that was the highest one that he had. Okay. Yeah. When you see a sodium level of 152 in a patient um, who is a 24-year-old male who doesn't seem to have any other medical issues, would you expect that that level of sodium would result in any mental status changes alone? No. Okay. Now, you indicated that that was that already coming down by the time you saw him at 11:30 on November 16th. Yes, yeah, so if you go back to the first page uh, and you look in the bottom right hand corner, it has labs and then there's the word glucose and then there's a series of numbers and this is sort of medical shorthand for how we write these electrolytes and that very first one, 146, that's the serum sodium okay. and that's almost normal. The, the labs vary, 144, 145 is usually the, the upper limit of normal. So at this point that you're seeing him at 11.30 on November 16th, his sodium is already back down to normal? Close. Okay. Close. Is, is, is potassium indicated somewhere in these numbers? That's right below. That's 3.0. Okay. Do you recall if that was, was normalizing as well? I don't, know what the, I don't know what the initial potassium was. I'd have to look at the complete record. I don't know. I'm pretty sure. I know that what medicine was doing is they were primarily giving him IV fluids and some potassium supplementation, and that's basically all they did. Okay. Um, when it says potassium at 3.0, is that coming within the normal range? I'd like to see it more about 3.5. Okay. Um, if it were lower than that before, then obviously it's coming up, right? Right. Uh, now, with regard to your... Your, n your next visit with him, which was later that day. Well, actually, before I go there, doctor, um, with this level of potassium, even though you'd like to see it at 3.5, would you expect any mental status changes in a 24-year-old male who's relatively healthy at this level of potassium? No, the, the most important thing that potassium controls is cardiac conduction. And unless his cardiac conduction was abnormal to the point where he wasn't perfusing his brain, I wouldn't suspect that in, in causing any kind of neurologic or psychiatric changes. Okay. So really the relevant thing for the, for, or the relevant number for the delirium resolving and hypernatremia is the sodium level, is that right? Yes. Okay. So I kind of started off that train of thought with the 700 cc's of urinary retention. Um, it, you said it should be kind of around 10. Maybe I'm off because I am not a doctor, but it sounds to me that he seems like he's retaining a significant amount of urine that he would be decently hydrated at that point in time. Well, they were giving him a lot of fluids, and because of this anticholinergic effect of the muscle and everything like that, uh, his urethra, you know, coming out of his bladder, it's closed down, and it's like a, it's like a dam, and, and the gate is closed. It's not letting the fluid out. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the next time you went to see him, and that would be on page three of these notes. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, How was Mr. Holmes doing at that point in time in the day? Well, he w the, the main change was is he wasn't so sedated. So in other words, when, when we do our mental status exam and we think the way that the brain works, the very first thing we look at is his level of attention, his level of consciousness. And that was much, much less impaired. Um, we, we could go in and talk to him. We didn't have to rub his sternum, move his extremities around, things like that. Okay. Um, I'd like to kind of go through this progress note with you a little bit. Um, I think I can read most of it. Um, okay. <laughs> 
So I'd like to just start at the top there. And if you can just kind of, because your handwriting, or well, I should say Dr. Moroz's handwriting, let's blame it on him, is not fabulous. If you could kind of just read uh, the first couple sentences sure. of that note, and then we'll talk about it. So it says uh, November 16th, 1450 hours. Uh, psych CL, that's psychiatry consultation liaison, follow-up note. Patient was sedated earlier this AM, uh, and the fam uh, formal interview was unable to be completed. Uh, the patient was seen again, and now he reports that he is in, and then this quotes, shadow boxes, uh, and that he, his voices are telling him to get water. Okay. So when things are in quotes here, are those things directly that Mr. Holmes said? Yes. Okay. What did you take that to mean? Sh I'm, he's in a shadow box and voices tell him to get water. Well, one of the things that we look at uh, fairly specifically are the presence of hallucinations. And hallucinations are when the brain interprets a sensory input that's not really there. So you see something that's not there, you hear something that's not there. And we interpreted the shadow box as a, sort of a vague primitive visual hallucination. But he also said that he was hearing voices, and that's an auditory hallucination. And it's important, in, in purely psychiatric illness, you tend to get primarily auditory hallucinations. Once something else is added on, then you think about medical conditions like delirium. So the fact that he had both to us meant that, his, that he, he had an element of delirium, he had an element of psychosis. Okay. Um, can, you, can you go on? Patient also... Also reported when asked about self-harm that he has bitten his arm for food. When asked what kind of food, patient reported, quote, protonaceous. Is, is that a medical word that I just don't know? Protonaceous? No. Okay. Um, can you explain to the jury why this information was significant? Well, it seemed illogical to us. It didn't make sense. Uh, and so the other thing that we try and evaluate is we try and evaluate a thought, a thought process. And in thought process, what we're really evaluating is language, okay, and, and how a person forms ideas. That's what thought process is. Thought content is, is more what do they believe, and thought process is how do they get there. And the more abnormal a thought process is, the more that makes us think about a psychotic process. Okay. So when you're writing these things down and Mr. Holmes is giving you these responses, are, are these two questions that you're asking him? Yes, and even though this was uh, more just sort of a, uh, a written progress note, and we try and use the format where if you go back to the first time we saw him on that first page, it's got the specific components of the mental status exam on there. We didn't really have to repeat too much in terms of things like general appearance, except that he was awake. We, we tried to describe those, but sometimes it's easier to follow if the specific components of the mental status are there. But that's not the way that we recorded this second note. Okay. So the next thing I think it says is patient denies... Visual that... hallucinations and active suicidal ideation. Okay. So you just kind of referred to the shadow box thing as perhaps possibly part of a visual hallucination. And that's what he said. He, it, for, for him, he, I don't think that he saw that as a visual hallucination, okay? He was making a description. And sometimes the way that a person experiences this and the way they get described, it's hard to convey in specific words. It, it depends on the limits of your vocabulary and, and how alert you are, because he was coming out of a delirium. He was sort of sedated and everything like that. So it, it, it seems a little bit incongruent, but the thing that we really kind of came away was that, that, that was more important than the shadow boxes or his denial of visual hallucinations was the auditory hallucinations. Okay. Um, and if you could go on and read the next sentence, patient reported. Uh, yeah, he, so he said that, uh, so he reported that he had... Um, not been eating for a few days because it made him sick and that the voices told him not to eat. Okay. Is it uh, common in somebody with psychosis to at some point not to stop eating? Common. Okay. Would you expect someone, um, a young man, 24 years old, relatively in good health, um, if they 
So I'm just trying to put this sort of not eating, not drinking in, in context in my mind. Does, if somebody doesn't eat for a couple days, does that make them become delirious, just not eating for a couple days? I, it would depend if they had any uh, comorbid medical illness and everything. And an otherwise healthy person, I mean, I, I guess you could look back, like when I was growing up, people would go on hunger strikes for political reasons, okay? Those people, they didn't get psychotic, okay? okay? And it would take them uh, usually a lot longer to be starved before they would start uh, getting medically ill to require medical attention. Okay. And the same with regard to not, not having water. If somebody, um, I'm assuming it, it takes, you would see changes in a person a little bit quicker. Is that fair to say for lack of? Yeah, hydrogen? water is way more important than food. Okay. Okay. So. Um, is it fair that it would take somebody who's younger and in a healthier state a lot longer to experience the effects of not eating and drinking than, say, somebody who is um, either, you know, very, very young, like a small child, or very, very old, or somebody who has, is otherwise compromised? Yes. Okay. So when, uh, when you hear him talk about not eating... Um, for a few days because it made him sick and the voice is telling him not to eat. Is that also psychiatrically significant? Yes. And how? Well, he's having, he's having command auditory hallucinations that are directing what he does in his life, even something as important as taking food and water. Now, that's a pretty basic thing that m most of the time we don't think about it. We just do it. It's, it's, it's the normal course of life to eat and drink. And he had specific auditory hallucinations that were preventing him from doing this. Okay. Um, when, I think the next thing that you have listed here are, are his vitals. Those are the vital signs. And were those uh, normal for, at that point? Well, the temperature, uh, it's not too bad. 148 over 98, he's a little bit hypertensive. You can get that with volume constriction. 125, his heart rate is still fast. You can see that with volume constriction. Um, uh, what, what's volume constriction? Uh, just not enough intervascular volume, not enough fluid on board. Okay. okay. I mean, he needed more fluids, more water. Okay. 98% uh, ORA means on room air. That's a, a little device they put on your finger, the pulse oximeter. Uh, okay. So that's pretty normal. Is, is this, are his vitals starting to normalize? They're getting better, but, but sometimes the mental status will improve before the blood pressure and the heart rate. Okay. Um, is there anything else significant that you think the jury needs to know about this note? Just that he was getting better and that he had the auditory hallucinations. Okay. Now, um, you, we, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but if you can explain to the jury, sort of, we've talked a little bit about delirium and about psychosis, what would you expect, how is del, what would you expect to see, what are the cardinal signs of delirium? Well, first, what I'd say is, is that psychosis is primarily a, a problem of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Delirium is primarily a problem of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and, and what we look at We'll look clinically, we'll look at what's the onset like. Delirium, onset, pretty fast. Psychosis, slow. What's the duration? Delirium, short. Psychosis, usually indefinite, if, unless it's due to a medical condition or a substance. What's the patient characteristic? Delirium, old, and old in psychiatry means older than 40. A lot of other medical illnesses, on a lot of medications. Um, there's rarely a family history for delirium, whereas there is in psychosis. The, the kind of Cadillac test is to do a brainwave test, an EEG. We almost never do that, but it would be presumably normal in psychosis, uh, and it would be abnormal in a person with delirium. It would have what they call diffuse slow wave slowing. And, that, and, and what it sort of tells you is, is that delirium is a, it's a global disorder of the brain because it really starts at the brain stem, whereas psychosis is further up the, uh, the structure of the brain. Okay. Um, with regard to delirium, would you expect more sort of inattention? Yeah. 
And yeah, thanks for reminding me. That's actually the cardinal feature. Uh, in delirium, there's inattention. They can't count backwards from 20. Uh, and psychosis attention is usually not impaired. But I think it's also important to say that they, they can coexist. They're not mutually exclusive. And there's a certain amount of overlap. So if you were going to look at this conceptually, uh, you might draw some Venn diagrams with a certain amount of intersection. OK. OK. Um, so w if somebody is psychotic, they are able to, their, their attention is there, but maybe their answers are disorganized or illogical or nonlinear. Right. Is that fair? Correct. OK. So you then saw Mr. Holmes next, I believe, on November 20th of 2012 in the morning. Is that right? Yes. Um, and so that starts on page four of these notes. Why hadn't you seen him in the days intervening? Well, when I saw him on Friday and then Saturday and Sunday, there's different people. These are pre-assigned. There's a call schedule. Those people come in, they basically take care of new admissions, consults, those sorts of things. On Monday, uh, Dr. Weintraub, it was his assignment to go down to the CCMF and not mine. So there was three other physicians that saw him between the time when I saw him on Friday and on Tuesday. Okay. And you had an opportunity to speak with them or review their information? To review you? their notes. Okay. Um, was Dr. Murrows with you again on the 20th? Yes. And you just said CCMF. What does that That's a for? correctional care medical facility. So in the bottom of Denver Health, there's a jail with sheriffs uh, and single rooms, um, a lot of security to get in there. It's, it's a regular jail, except that they have access to all the medical assets of Denver Health. OK. And so anybody that comes from a jail facility to Denver Health would be housed there. Is that correct? Or any correctional facility. Unless they're so sick that they have to be in intensive care unit or something like that. But all the people that come to the CCMF, they're arrested. They're incarcerated. Okay. So when you mean so sick they have to be in intensive care, you mean sort of like they're in, a, in an accident and they have a head yeah, injury? on a ventilator or something like that. And if, and if they were arrested, then there would be a sheriff or a police officer, somebody like that, right at the bedside. Okay. So when somebody is on CCMF, there are also deputies down there that mm -hmm. can um, monitor them. Is that right? Yeah. Video camera in the rooms to monitor them? Yes. OK. So let's talk about this November 20th visit. Um, tell the jury what was different or the same about Mr. Holmes at that time. Well, he was markedly improved. Uh, he had been in restraints most of the time that was, he was in the CCMF, and that's the call of the sheriffs. They run that facility, but he no longer required restraints. Uh, he could talk about uh, changes in his auditory hallucinations, his perception of the effect of the respiratol. Uh, he was much more alert, much more conversant. Okay. Let's kind of go through this note. Um, what do you indicate there at the beginning of the subjective interval history? It just says, patient seen and evaluated with Dr. Holland, attending psychiatrist, chart reviewed. Um, he's had an intense period where he's much more lucid and linear. He reports that he didn't sleep much overnight, but that he slept intermittently throughout the day. He reports that he no longer has visual hallucinations and that his auditory hallucinations have decreased to minimal. Uh, and then he, instead of the shadow box, he talks about them as sort of shadow voices, which okay. gave us the perception that they may not be as distinct, because in some previous notes, he could count up to eight different voices and even clarify the gender, uh, seven men, one woman. And we, we think when the voices are that concrete, that it sort of raises our suspicion that this is a primary psychotic process. Okay. So he, he was just, he was a lot better. Is that um, normal for, I mean, is, is, that's what the antipsychotic medication is directed at, right? These that's what happens when people take their medicines as directed, they get better. Okay. It's not unexpected that he might respond this quickly. Especially uh, if he's never been treated with antipsychotics before. Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. What does that mean? Well, we yeah. request to approach. Yes.
Okay, Ms. Higgs, you may proceed as um, we discussed at the um, bench conference. Thank you. Doctor, did you talk to Mr. Holmes on the 20th about the effect of, his, of the antipsychotic medication? Yes. And what, what was the response? His perception was that it had decreased his auditory hallucinations and that helped him. And what was your opinion? I agreed. Okay. Um, when we look at this note, is that indicated here in your progress note? Yes. And can you, can you kind of read where? So it would be the last page at the bottom where it says attending only below this line. I have directly interviewed this man. Uh, I've reviewed all the psychiatric notes uh, since my last contact. The patient is remarkably better uh, compared to last Friday. He's alert, interactive, um, out of restraints, better sleep. Um, he acknowledges that his medications are helping him with both auditory and visual hallucinations. Visual hallucinations seem gone. His auditory hallucinations have been complex with up to, I put six different voices there. Diagnosis remains psychosis NOS. His response to antipsychotic has been excellent. He should stay on Risperidone. What was his dose of Risperdal when um, he was discharged from Denver Health? He was getting two milligrams at night and one milligram in the morning. Had, had that changed at all from your A little bit. We, on Friday, we started him at one milligram twice a day, and, and I think the Sunday physician increased it to two milligrams at night. So it was a, about a 30% you know, increase. Um, is, is, is that a low dose, a normal dose? I'd say it's... I'd say it's sort of in the middle. Okay. We, we don't like to go over six milligrams with this dose. Um, you can use this medication in other more vulnerable populations, say like a geriatric population, and you might use a dose of, of 0.25 or 0.5 milligrams. That's small. Okay. I, I'd say that this was fairly average for new, new onset psychosis. Okay. When you indicated that his response to the antipsychotic has been excellent, um, how was that significant for you? Well, it worked. Objection. This is a similar objection to up uh, before, Your Honor. Not overruled. This is specific to, to the defendant. He reported his hallucinations were improved. He looked better. We always talk to the sheriffs and the nurses. They're very experienced. They've been around for a long time. Everybody's impression was that he was doing better. Um, did, you, did he seem to be pleased with the medication? Yes. He, to me, he gave me that he was, there was less suffering. Now, you've also indicated, uh, I just have a, a, a few more things I want to follow up with you on this November 20th note, doctor. Um, and it's on the, so it would be page four of these exhibits or the first page of your November 20th note. And one of the things that you wrote here is delusions, none, I think none evident, is that right? Right. Okay. Now, when a patient comes in who has been arrested and is, is an inmate at a correctional facility, um, is it your practice to talk to them about the offense for which they are there? No. Why not? We try and keep a pretty firm boundary between what's going on medically, and I, when, when I say medically, I include psychiatry and what the legal charges are. We don't have any control over what the sheriffs do uh, in terms of does the person get to watch TV, those kinds of things. So we're basically guests in this uh, incarceration facility. We try and address strictly the medical issues. We don't tell uh, the people when they're going back to jail, anything else like that. We, we never get involved with that. Okay. And, and doctor, you did not speak with Mr. Holmes about the charges for which he was there. Not at all. Okay. Um, you had initially, initially said on November 16th that delirium was resolving at that time. Mm -hmm. What was your opinion about delirium by November 20th of 2012? It's gone. Okay. Um, were his, what, were his, was his medical situation with regard to sodium and potassium, all that had evened out? 
Yeah, and that, that evened out pretty quickly. I mean, even by Friday, Saturday, his electrolytes, they got, they got the labs every single day, but it wasn't really much of a concern. And we, talk, we always talk with the medical people, but for them, it was really easy. I mean, just a little bit of IV fluid and a little bit of potassium, and it was pretty simple. Okay. In your opinion, doctor, um, do you think, what role do you think delirium played in Mr. Holmes' presentation at Denver Health Medical Center? I think that uh, the way that I put it together when I look at the notes from the jail from November 11th on, uh, that his psychosis grew, his psychosis caused him not to eat or drink, and that gave him a starvation ketosis. Uh, he came in, the starvation ketosis got fixed, there was some residual psychosis, which improved on the Respiradol. Okay. Do you think the delirium played a major or, or minor role in how he presented at the hospital on, uh, for you on November 16th? For me, it was minor. Okay. Um, and ultimately, uh, when you had initially uh, indicated on November 16th of 2012 that the AXIS-1 diagnosis was psychosis NOS, um, what, it, what was your opinion about that diagnosis by November 20th of 2012? Same. Okay. I think we're done. If you'll just give me one moment. Thank you, Doctor. I don't have any questions, any more questions for you at this time. Mr. Orman. Hello, Doctor. Hi. My name is Rich Orman. I'm one of the DAs on this case. If I ask a question that you do not understand, will you please let me know that? Thanks. That was what we call a non-responsive answer. I will let you know. Okay. Um, I want to touch, actually, I want to start sort of at near the end of what Ms. Higgs was asking you about. We have this note here on, uh, it's, I guess, the second to last page of uh, D-TR-78. Uh, top of it says uh, Denver Health Medical Center psych psychiatry progress note dated November 20th at 820. See that one? Yes. And she was asking you about the uh, mental status exam. And she asked you specifically about this, uh, I guess it's the third item down on the right hand side of uh, where it says delusions. Correct. And the note says none evident. Do you see that? Yes. And Ms. Higgs um, sort of implied, I think, asking questions that, well, you couldn't ask him about delusions because that would mean asking about the crime. Objection, Your Honors, to the form of the question as to what I implied. Um, sustain. Rephrase the question, please. Now, all right. I'll, thank you, Your Honor. Delusions, the presence or absence of delusions can be a consideration that a psychiatrist has to take into account in determining a diagnosis, correct? Yes. For instance, with uh, schizophrenia, the, the presence or absence of a delusion can be important about whether that's the diagnosis or not, correct? Yes. And uh, you, it's not like when you looked at this, you ignored whether there, a delusion might be present because that was sort of an area where you could not go into, correct? We could ask him some general questions. I mean, when he, one of the statements uh, in... Uh, an, hang, hang, hang on, doctor. Okay. Uh, did, is that, was that, was it correct, yes or no? Well, well repeat the question, okay. please. So, uh, the, the question of whether there was delusion is, is something that a psychiatrist goes into when making a diagnosis when you think there might be a psychosis, correct? Yes. And uh, that was not an area that you were forbidden from going into, correct? We could ask about delusions without asking about the alleged crime. In fact, uh, if you were not able to look at delusions, would the answer be none evident, or would it be something like we can't look into that? I think that the way we wrote it was the correct way, none evident. So you saw no evidence of any delusion? Not at that evaluation after he had right. been treated. And the first one where, where we have, it's the first page of this, it says UTA for delusions unable, unable to Unable to assess, okay. right. Is that assess or ascertain? I've Unable to assess. Okay. So the first time we see delusions under a mental status exam where your name is on it, it says unable to as assess. And when I look at this, the only other time we see that line in there for a mental status exam is on the 20th. And there you say none evident, correct? Correct. So you, in all the time that you were with the defendant, you saw no evidence of a delusion? 
I wasn't the only person who saw him. I'm asking about what you saw. Did you see evidence of a delusion? Not when I saw him. And how long did you see him? Uh, all of these evaluations, they're timed, and on average, they're about 30 minutes from the time that we go down there to the time we leave. So would that be an hour total or an hour and a half total? Hour and a half. You talked about uh, having uh, uh, some information from the jail as far as some jail notes. How far did those go back? The, the ones that I concentrated on started, they were a little bit before November 11th, but the ones before November 11th, there was nothing going on. It was, he was eating, drinking, normal hygiene, watching TV. They were very short. On Sunday, November the 11th, uh, they became the, uh, just the size of the notes got much bigger in the content of what I previously described. And that pattern continued until he came to us on the 15th. How far back before le November 11th did they go? The ones I had, uh, maybe two days. So the first information, is, um, what does prodromal mean? Prodromal means something that's, that's subtle, it's not overt, and oftentimes it's only obvious in retrospect. So in, in, for psychosis, we might, a prodrome might be something where the patient uh, starts talking unusual ideas, uh, maybe at a, an, uh, an abnormal for that person interest in philosophy or religion or a cult. That would be prodromal for psychiatry. And Dr. Davis said it was like, f like four or five days prodromal in this case. Is that about right? I don't know if she used that term. I think that she was looking at the same records that we were from, from November 11th to November 15th when he came in. The jail notes were clear, uh, running into walls, hitting head, not eating, defecating, smearing feces. All of those things would fall under the rubric for us of disorganized behavior. But you really didn't have any information about what had happened prior to that? No. Well, okay. Did you have any information? I think I asked the question badly. Did you have any information really of uh, uh, more than a couple days prior to that, November nope. 11th? No. And you certainly um, didn't contact his prior psychiatrist, Dr. Fenton, correct? No. That's not correct? Did not contact anybody. You didn't go um, look at, uh, you didn't go ask for the medical records prior to, let's say, November 9th, correct? That is correct. You didn't... Um, ask for police reports or anything like that, correct? All we had was the jail records from November 11th on. And the reason for that is because this is not a forensic examination, correct? That is correct. You were never asked to opine on legal sanity or, or, or to do a full examination of the defendant that would look at all the issues that a forensic examination would do, correct? Correct. And a forensic examiner would want to do those things, to get a full history, to talk to other doctors, maybe family members, things like that, correct? Sure, yes. And have you ever done a forensic examination? No. But you sort of, in general, understand what they are? I've done short-term certification and involuntary medications. For those, do you want to go back and get as full a record as you can? Yes. But your role was really limited here to what's in front of me right now from a medical perspective. Yes. Now, did you, uh, so you, did you have any jail video from Arapahoe County? No. And you certainly then had zero information about the defendant's um, psychiatric state in, let's say, May of 2012 or June or July of 2012, correct? That's correct. I don't happen to have a DSM-4 TR with me, but, and, I, and I, I, this, I don't mean this to seem like a pop quiz, okay. but could you tell me what it says, what psychotic disorder not otherwise specified is in the DSM-4 TR? Well, that's when you have, uh, you know, a, a constellation of hallucinations, delusions, disorganized speech, disorganized behavior that doesn't fully fit the criteria for schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, mood disorder with psychotic features, which could be depression, bipolar, uh, psychosis that's associated with borderline personality disorder, schizotypal, 
That's, psychosis is really, it's not a categorical diagnosis, it's a dimension, it's a domain. It doesn't fit anything else. You know that there's psychosis there, but you can't fit it in any other diagnosis. It doesn't fit into brief psychotic disorder, schizophreniform disorder, none of those other things. If you had had, let's say, a full medical history, talk to psychiatrists that had previously treated him, things like that, you could have had a different diagnosis, correct? Because you would have had more information? Sure, especially the time course. We didn't, we didn't have definitive information about the time course. If this is something that had happened over six months, a couple of years, there were prior hospitalizations, all those sorts of things would have made, it would have helped us a lot. I think there's a reference in here to a CT scan. Is that correct? I think it's on the... He had two CT scans. Two CT... Do you know what days those were? Uh, the first one, I think, was on Tuesday. Where's my calendar? It was Tuesday, the 13th of November. That one, he was just sent from the jail after he'd hit his head. The physician there was concerned. They sent him to Denver Health. My understanding is he strictly got a CT scan. He had no clinical evaluation. Came back, it was okay. And then sometime during the admission to Denver Health, between the 15th and the 20th, he had a CT. I think that was on the weekend. I can't give you the specific date. And, and that when we say a, a CT scan, is that also sometimes commonly referred to as a CAT scan? Same thing. Did you look at the CT scans? No. Did you look at any reports relating to them? Yes. Were they normal? Yes. And would, would another way to express that be negative? Negative. Meaning uh, nothing unusual about them? Correct. What, what does the term pre-morbid function mean? I, think, I thought I heard you say that. Premorbid function means, so when a person has, uh, when there's a, uh, a fairly obvious onset, a discrete episode of illness, premorbid function means you try and go back and see what were they like before that illness started. And it may be as simple as what were they like before the hospital admission started or before they came to clinic. And that would mean talking to family members, getting collateral history, that sort of thing. And that was the type of information that you, was not part of sort of the type of evaluation you were doing in this case. That's correct. So the information that you would have about the pre-morbid function, about what he was like before he came to the hospital, was extremely limited. In fact, was limited only to the notes maybe that go back to November 9th from the jail. Correct. So the type of thing that you might want to see would be notes going back to, let's say, when he was first put in the jail, if you were looking for pre-morbid function, correct? Go back even further than that. If I was in an outpatient clinic and I was going to follow this person, I'd want to know uh, what it was like, were there any problems uh, when he was uh, with his mother's pregnancy? What was his childhood development like? How did he do in school? Uh, has he been married? Was he in the military? Did he have jobs? We didn't, we had none of that data. Would you want to look at things like um, the, the jail, you know what jail kite is? No. A, a message, let's say, that a, a person in the jail sends to the jail staff saying, I'd like to have this, I'd like books, here are the issues I see, when they actually write it out? That, that could be useful. How about, um, let's say, information contained on the computer of a person, what their writings were, their emails, things like that. Would that be information you would want to have for uh, pre-morbid functioning? Uh, possibly. I think that's beyond what most clinical psychiatrists would go into. But certainly maybe something a forensic psychiatrist. For sure. Now, when you were talking with the defendant, uh, you were there as an attending physician, correct? Yes. So you, w would it be fair to say you were overseeing the, Dr. Um, Moroz, or were you doing this along with him? I was supervising him, but in, in a case like this, I and mean, we knew that this was pretty high visibility, I mean, my pr I was directing what was happening. Dr. Moroz was my scribe. I was in charge. So when he writes something down, would you say, okay, write this down, or would you just check to make sure it was accurate? I would tell him what to write down. 
Now at the end of this on November 20th, 2012, the, the, the disposition says it's okay to send them back to Arapahoe County Jail or potentially the CMHIP, correct? That's correct. Because you felt that he was in a state where what, he wasn't dangerous to people in the jail or himself? He was safe enough to go to uh, an environment that, was, that had less medical assets than we did. We don't have any control on whether he came back to Arapahoe Jail or went to Pueblo, but for me, either one would have been safe. That's our job, is to make sure that he's safe, because we're sort of the highest level of medical care that you can get while you're still incarcerated. Okay. Let me just see if anyone else has any questions I should ask you. Thank you, Doctor. Is there any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. I, I want to avoid feedback from the two microphones. Um, Doctor, um, when you talk to Mr. Holmes about his concerns about eating and drinking, um, that, that line of questioning, did you consider that that might be some type of paranoid delusion he was having? Yes, and although he didn't say it to me, there was in other people's notes that he thought that there was something in his food. So for us, a delusion is a fixed false belief, and that qualified for a delusion. It's just that it wasn't present during my first examination because he was too somnolent, and then the last examination because he was so much improved. Okay. And, Doctor, is it also correct that someone may have a delusion, but unless you kind of are able to touch on the topic of that with them, um, you may never know that that delusion is there? A lot of patients with delusions don't like to talk about them. Okay. And, and so even if you ask them about it, they may conceal what their beliefs are. With regard to all of the information that um, you didn't collect, what you, what you stated there at the end was that your job was to make sure that Mr. Holmes was safe to himself. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Um, so it was sort of an acute treatment situation. Is that right? Yes. Um, now, certainly if you were doing some long-term diagnosis, you would want to know if he had a prior family history of, say, um, of mental illness. Is that right? Yes. Um, and you would want to know if he had been pre treated by a doctor before? Yes. Objection to the form of the question it's leading. Justine. <laughs> would you want to know how, what those doctors thought of, of Mr. Holmes as far as his mental illness? Yes. Okay. Um, and would you want to know if he sort of had any odd or uh, crazy writings that he had produced? Yes. If he had sort of espoused any weird um, philosophical ideas, that, would that be important to you? Yes. Would it be important to you to know if he had sort of a history of negative symptoms of a mental illness? Yes. Now, you also said that with the psychosis NOS, this was a diagnosis that you couldn't fit into any other mental illness diagnoses, and you listed off some. Now, is that because you, you were doing an acute treatment and you were not collecting all that prior information? We were too acute, and that data wasn't available to us. Okay. If you had been following up with Mr. Holmes, would you have tried to go out and collect that data? Yes. And would you have tried to take that psychosis NOS diagnosis and fit it into one of those other mental illnesses? Yes. Is that how sort of psychiatric diagnosis works? Yes. Okay. You were also asked about the two CT scans. Do you recall that? Yes. Um, I think Mr. Orman said it was um, one way to describe them th is that they were negative, correct? Correct. Does that mean Mr. Holmes was not psychotic when he was at Denver Health Medical Center? No, the CT scans are almost, they almost never show any positive findings in people with purely psychiatric illness. Okay. Um, Mr. 
Uh, Mr. Orman asked you about uh, Mr. Holmes being safe to release either back to the Arapahoe County Jail or to, I think he said CMHIP and you said Pueblo. Mm -hmm. What is that? Well, that's the state uh, hospital where they, they go into a much more uh, drawn-out evaluation of this person's competency, and we're not really equipped to do that. Okay. And, and that would be a safe place for him as well? They have a locked facility, is that correct? Yes. Kind of? Okay. Uh, I don't believe I have any more questions, but if you just give me a moment. Nope. Thank you very much, Dr. Holland. I don't have any recross your All right, the jury appears to have some questions. So give us a moment, please, doctor. No? Oh. Ah, sorry, you're putting papers down where the jury questions are. Okay. All right, let's retrieve then all the um, copies of the exhibit that were distributed or, yeah, that were distributed a moment ago. And uh, may Dr. Holland be released from his subpoena, Ms. Higgs? Yes, Your Honor, he can. Any objection, Mr. Orman? No, All right, Doctor, thank you. All right, members of the jury, it's uh, 7 after 3. Let's go ahead and take our afternoon break. Please uh, make sure you abide by all my admonishments during the break. Enjoy the break. I'll see you back here in 20 minutes. Thank you. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom. Is there anything on behalf of the people at this time? No. no? All right. Mr. King? There's one thing that I wanted to bring up, and that was um, in light of the objection that we had this morning um, that, that Ms. Pearson made to, um, to uh, Dr. Davis, we, it caused us to look at our endorsement P261 again. D261 again, <laughs> and um, we're at a loss as to how this happened, Judge, but somehow when we drafted uh, D261, we included Dr. Davis, um, uh, um, uh, Ms. Roth, uh, we included uh, Dr. Gray, um, all three of them it, as expert witnesses in our expert endorsement, and we listed um, what the subject matter of their testimony was going to be. Somehow, in the formatting and filing of that document, doctors Gray, Roth, and she's not a doctor, a social worker, but and Davis, who are from three different categories of witnesses, um, were not listed under the expert witness endorsement. And that's what happened with the regard to Dr. Davis this morning. Um, I'm concerned about Dr. Gray, because as you know, Dr. Gray is a psychologist from CMHIP. Dr. Gray conducted testing with regard to both Dr. Metzner's evaluation and Dr. Reed's evaluation. Um, we endorsed Dr. Um, uh, Gray on our 32.1 disclosures as an expert. The prosecution endorsed him as an expert. We um, endorsed all of the prosecution's experts as well. But somehow we made, that mistake was made somehow um, of um, uh, missing the endorsement of those two doctors properly, a typographical error, as experts under Rule 702 in this case. So I don't think that there's any prejudice to, to the people. We're happy to file a supplemental endorsement today. Um, the materials that are contained in their reports and materials are all have been disclosed for years now um, by the uh, doctors and by the, the state hospital in Pueblo. But I wanted to bring that to the court's attention uh, and counsel's attention, frankly, that we made that error um, somehow. And, and as I said, uh, we're happy to provide the draft document that we uh, intended to file, which has them properly listed, um, but somehow in the course of putting that into our program that formats it and files it, um, we, uh, um, 
we get listed them in the wrong place, despite the subject matter of their testimony being properly listed. So um, I don't know if there's going to be an objection to Dr. Gray's testimony by the people or if they're going to request more time with regard to his testimony. I have him scheduled to come in now on Thursday of this week. Um, and I wanted to make sure if there's any kind of problem or confusion and he's going to have to come back next week or something that we can um, accommodate his schedule and work that work that out. But I wanted to bring that to the court and counsel's attention uh, to see if there was any going to be any objection or not. Um, and and I, that's all I have, Judge. You, you did endorse Dr. Van Guso, the, the other person from CMHIP who did psychological testing. Yes, and we endorsed... And we, and we listed them together, the subject matter of what their testimony was going to be. But somehow, and I'm not blaming anyone on our staff, but somehow something happened where the name got listed under the wrong place. And um, it was a mistake, and it was a typographical type of error and not a substantive error. Um, and, and so we're going to be asking to call Dr. Gray and, and um, qualify him under Rule 702, but I wanted to bring this all to the court and everyone else's attention. And, and your intention is to call him to testify about the testing, the psychological testing that he conducted at CMHIP, which uh, experts have relied upon, correct? That's correct, Your Honor, and he didn't opine as to sanity, uh, nor did he opine as to a diagnosis. Uh, he and Dr. Manguso wrote their report together, so it's a combined report. Uh, they did their clinical interview together, so it's a combined clinical interview. Um, they list possible differential diagnoses in their um, evaluation, but they don't render a diagnosis. They don't render opinions about sanity. They just basically conducted their testing and submitting their testing to the psychiatrist. And what about Margaret Roth? Are you uh, intending to call her as an expert witness or, or more as a fact witness to talk about um, her interaction with the defendant before the defendant saw Dr. Fenton? Not, not as an expert witness at all, Judge. And, and frankly, um, I, I'm less concerned about that testimony and, and we could forego that testimony, I think. Her, all of her notes are, have been admitted into evidence in uh, People's Exhibit PTR 1248 already anyways. So um, that's not as concerning to me. What is concerning to me is this psychologist who has played an integral role in both of the court's um, uh, sanity evaluations that were done and have been relied upon by both of the court's experts and all of the other experts in the case. All right. Do the people want to think about this over the break, or do you want to take a position now? Well, it's, uh, I will say that Mr. Brockler had to step out, and that is uh, Doc, uh, Dr. Gray is Mr. Brockler's witness. Uh, but I would just say I, I cannot imagine the defense would not object if I made a similar representation, representation that Mr. King just did. And I think the, Mr. King would say that they were prejudiced, that they did not expect this witness to testify as an expert because that's what we would have put in an um, a endorsement. And I, 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 it, it just seems to me that they are not taking the same position that they would if we had made such an error. And uh, I, I really don't think there would be a difference in situation under such circumstances, but, but I, that's just an observation I have. All right. So do you want to take a, a formal position now, Mr. Ormer, or do you want to wait to speak to Mr. Brockler? I, I want to wait to speak, to speak to Mr. Brockler and see what he has to say about that. Okay. All right. We'll uh, proceed in that fashion then. We'll be on break. Thank you. I'll see you back here at, uh, let's make it uh, about uh, 3.30 or so.